Perhaps no other part of God's Word is more revealing about our relationship with God and Jesus Christ than the words of Jesus Christ in John 17. <clears throat> Sounds like I'm going to have to fight my voice a little bit today here. A remarkable prayer, and I'd like to begin my sermon today in John 17, highlighting a particular theme that emerges here. The title for my sermon is Making Atonement. And of course I'm talking about what Jesus Christ did at the direction of the Father, but it's an ongoing commitment on the part of the family of God to make atonement with their creation, mankind. Let's pick up a few things that Jesus Christ said. <clears throat> He said in verse 4, let me just step away from the microphone a second. Sorry about that. I could normally get a glass of water. We'll see if I can talk through this. <clears throat> Starting again in John 17 and verse 4, Christ said, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And then he said, O oh, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. And then in verse 24, just to pick up that theme, I'd like to read his words at the close of that verse. For he says to the Father, you love me before the foundation of the world. What I will point out is that this plan that Christ is addressing in the verses I'm about to read had a beginning long before just the physical creation of mankind. But let's pick up something he asked in verse 11. He said, Now as he prays to the Father, I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, Keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. And then continuing in verse 21 of this 17th chapter of John. Well, let me pick it up in verse 20 for a little better context here. I do not pray for these alone. Talking about his immediate disciples, the ones who had followed him and remained faithful, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, just as we find ourselves the recipients of that faith 2,000 years subsequent. Verse 21 That they may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which I you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I and them, and you and me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. The love of the Father makes this oneness possible through Jesus Christ. Let's go back to verse 15 because another player is at work here. Actually the one that resists, that fights against this unity with Jesus Christ and the Father that we are supposed to have. In verse 15 I do not pray that you should take them, the disciples, and that includes us in our time, out of the world. No, we're right in the midst of the world, for sure. We're, we're physical, we're weak, we need help, we're tempted, we're tried, we run the gauntlet. But, in verse 15, that you should keep them from the evil one. There is a fight there is an individual who does not want us to have 
atonement with God. Genesis 3 and verse 15, going all the way back now to the first book of the Bible, to show you how this epic battle has continued from the very creation of mankind. And I'm talking about the battle for becoming one with God through the means that he's made it possible to made possible to us Genesis 3 and verse 15 God says here and I will put enmity that is hatred between you and the woman and he's speaking to the serpent here and between your seed and her seed he now that's a capital H E so it's speaking of Jesus Christ actually he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Which Satan did by possessing Judas and betraying Christ, which led to his crucifixion. But let me ask you a question. How does Satan have offspring? If this is an analogy in this verse 15 about Satan in the form of the snake. Well, John 8, verse 44 answers that question. Christ speaking to Jews of his days made the statement, you are, in John 8, verse 44, I should say, you are of your father the devil. You're assigning that kind of relationship because of what he begets what he transfers in the attitude and the desires of your father which again is Satan you want to do he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth he caused the death of by deception of Adam and Eve and then of consequently death spread to all man because all sinned Continuing, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. For he is a liar and the father of it. That's how Satan has seed. First John 3 and verse 8 makes a powerful statement in this regard. First John 3 and verse 8. <clears throat> He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. In that destruction that he achieves, he will be crushing, bruising the heel of Satan, so to speak. But that by doing that, he opens a way for reconciliation, for atonement with God. Following up from what was stated in Genesis 3, verse 15, I asked this question, how does capital H, he, Christ, bruise Satan's head? Well, God will take care of this. That's a promise, Romans 16 and verse 20. Because Satan is the adversary. He's the one who is fighting against mankind becoming born again members in the family of God. Romans 16 and verse 20, And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. God will take care of that crushing. That's why we can really understand Genesis 3 verse 15 what is mentioned there continuing the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you amen and then in Revelation 20 and verse 10 we find fulfillment of what is prophesied what is promised in Romans 16 prophesied in Genesis 3 but in Revelation 20 and verse 10 I'd like to read this from Tyndale which is a really old translation and in many ways absolutely excellent 
getting close to the core of translating from the Greek in this case. So let me read it to you. It's, it's pretty much parallel to what you'll find in your new King James. And the devil that deceived them was cast into a lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet were cast. Not where they are, but where they were. They're not there anymore because they've been burned up. And shall be tormented day and night forevermore. That's the fate of Satan. Cast into outer darkness. These things will progress and transpire, but Satan will be removed from having anything to do with the kingdom of God as an eventual fate. Face, uh, fate. Boy, when you don't eat, even the words don't work, do they? <laughs> so, I take from Genesis 3, verse 15, that a plan... A well-organized, a well-thought-out plan was in place about taking care of Satan and also helping mankind. And it was in place long before Adam and Eve sinned. First Peter, verse one, chapter one, and verse twenty. This speaks of Jesus Christ the one who is making atonement for us. 1 Peter 1 and verse 20, He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. The plan was in place. And I think by understanding that, and by reviewing it each year when these feast days roll around, we can reinforce the importance of what we're doing by taking 24 hours without food and water and just relying on God and taking that step to as much as we can humble ourselves uh, to get our self-interest out of the way. Revelation 13 and verse 8 talks about this terrible time ahead when the false when the beast and the false prophet will arise. Revelation 13 and verse 8. It's interesting, the context of what is stated here is how it's presented. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, speaking of the beast and, the, of course, the whole system, the false prophet, the false religious system, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, and then it goes on to describe the Lamb as having been slain from the foundation of the world before the world was in place, as these other scriptures support. So it's an important plan. What we are doing is important to show our obedience to God because ultimately, in atonement, what do we want? We want access to God. We want, even before that, forgiveness of our sins. Jesus Christ makes all of these things possible. Let's go back and review some specifics now about this day that we're observing. Leviticus 23. It lays out here specific instructions for the holy days. Some with more details, others with just very cursory outlines. Leviticus 23 and verse 4, though, these are the feasts of the Lord, holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at their appointed times. And as I have said before, even on trumpets, so we are proclaiming these by not just what I'm doing up here, but by us appearing before God together in unity to simply obey Him and keep this day. Observe it. Verses 26 through 32 then talk about the Day of Atonement. And I'd like to read what's written here. 
And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Also the tenth day of the seventh month shall be the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. We go without food and water, and that's what this means, to afflict your souls. And you shall do no work on that same day, for it is the day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord your God, to have someone either look past our sins or to actually cause our sins to be removed, as we shall see in what Jesus Christ has accomplished. For any person who is not afflicted in soul on that same day shall be cut off from his people. And any person who does any work on that same day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all of your dwellings. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict your souls on the tenth day of the month at evening, from evening to evening, you shall celebrate your Sabbath. Observe it, celebrate it. And we do as we spend time in the church, actually approach this day, and, and, and we should certainly, the Day of Atonement, not just with what we're going to go without, but what that really means in terms of fulfillment as a type and something we've already received if we have been baptized and if our sins have been covered by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, we have individually been atoned for. We can then continue on with the down payment of the Holy Spirit and receive eternal life when that time comes God is looking for an attitude on this day, and we find what he will accept in Isaiah 66 and verse 2. Reading a portion of that verse, Isaiah 66 and verse 2, here's what God says. Here is what he is looking for. But on this one will I look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. We can show our respect for his word by being obedient, which we are doing this day. Leviticus 16, which I won't go through in great detail, but just mentioning all the ceremonial things that were done there, of having two goats, one was let go in the wilderness, the other one was killed as a sacrifice. Of course, the, the analogy again of Satan and Jesus Christ in, in that order. But here's the command as it's summed up in Leviticus 16 and verse 34. The instructions given to Moses, this shall, by God, this shall be an everlasting statute for you to make atonement for the children of Israel for all of their sins once a year. And he did, that is, Moses did as the Lord commanded him. At that time, it was once a year. It was just kind of a place card holding in abeyance the penalties that would come for the sins that all of Israel had committed until the true Redeemer came. You see, sacrifice is necessary for atonement. Hebrews 9 and verse 22 says, And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, no forgiveness of sins. We are guilty of sin, 
as we come to a knowledge of the truth. And we want to be forgiven. And the penalty of sin is what? Romans 6, 23. It's death. So blood is required, and that's what the reference is right there. So sacrifice is necessary for atonement. Just a little bit of a sidebar, and we are coming up to the Feast of Tabernacles on the last great day. The, ver the chapters in Ezekiel 40 through 48, which I am not turning to, are very explicit about this future time when these holy days that we observe now will also be in force. Atonement will be observed. The year of release, Jubilee, will be observed. And what we're doing right now will be carried on in the future. And I think that's important to understand because it places the context of God's great master plan in a much broader range. <clears throat> now here's kind of the nitty gritty of what I want to talk about today. To remind us of, because it was Jesus Christ who died for us, who fulfilled prophecies, who alone was able to pay the consummate price for sin, for all of mankind, for all of the creation, the physical creation, which we are. Let's go to Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 12. This section, of course, we refer to in the Passover season. The theme reemerges in the holy days of the role of Jesus Christ. They're all about him and the work that he's accomplishing. When he said to the Father in that prayer, and it's recorded in John 17, I have finished your work or the work you have given me, he was talking about a specific segment of the work. The work goes on. We serve the Lord Jesus Christ in fulfilling the work of preaching the gospel. Isaiah 53, let's begin to read in verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs, our sicknesses. Sometimes when we're sick, when we're really down and discouraged, and I've heard from people who have faced just unparalleled troubles and woes and the death of a young daughter who was a mother of three and, you know, where do you turn at that point? You don't have the power to resurrect someone to make things the way they were, but God does and God will in his own due time and it takes faith to wait on him. But let me continue. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. He took it all upon himself. And by his stripes we are healed. And we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's pretty explicit. That describes what Jesus Christ sh shouldered, what he took on. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, and he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. He was the lamb of sacrifice. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Verse 5, 
Verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He was, he has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. His seed will be us, brethren of Jesus Christ. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteousness, our righteous servant, shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. That's an ongoing responsibility of the high priest that Jesus Christ is. I'm not so much focusing on that priestly role in this sermon, more to drive home again once again and again and again the fact that Jesus Christ paid the price and it cost his life. The one who had been alive from eternity was willing to set that as his life aside and die for us. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. When the apostles were turning to the Old Testament and proving from the Old Testament that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, this is the kind of text that they use because Christ exactly fulfilled all that was written here. Some rejected even that proof of the own, their own text, but still, it stands. Let's go to Romans now. Staying on this theme of what Jesus Christ did for us. Romans 5, verses 6 through 11. Romans 5 and verse 6, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. And that's a little bit of a chance, you know. He wants everybody to be saved. That's God's desire, but some people spit in God's face because they turn away from the truth, reject the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, which is such a costly and high, on, high value sacrifice that he was able to bring before God. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You can think back personally. It's always a good starting point. Consider yourself before you were led to conversion. You can look around this world and see the vile wickedness that is extant and understand that Christ died so that these people would eventually have a chance to repent, to take his sacrifice in place of their own. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, this shedding of his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Of course, that's his priestly role. And God knew that even with a down payment of the Holy Spirit, man would still stumble and fall. So he really needed a good atoning sacrifice, one that was good for the long run. The warranty does not run out here as long as we keep our part of the bargain and don't turn away from God. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, though through whom we have now received the reconciliation, that is the atonement. That's where it comes from. That's how we get it. 
Ephesians 5.2. I'll skip around a little bit to keep driving this point about the sacrifice of Christ. It's a central theme in the Old Testament. It is a central theme in the New Testament. Ephesians 5 and verse 1 to begin, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us, and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma, one that God would accept, a perfect life, sinless. And add to that, Jesus Christ is the very Son of God from eternity. Now back to Romans 3. Verses 23 through 26. This statement is made, and it is a absolutely true statement. Romans 3 and verse 23 to begin with here. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That's how we are redeemed, through Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation, a reconciliation, I should say, or translate, by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. 1 John 2 and verse 2 says something similar, and I'm giving you these various references to once again emphatically make the point that Jesus Christ died for us so that we could live and not only just live, attain eternal life. 1 John 2 and verse 2, And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. That word means atonement. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. We're not just a small, separate, iconoclastic group of people off in a corner somewhere. We're the seed that will grow like the mustard seed and grow into the kingdom of God as more and more people learn the truth or taught the truth and turn to the sacrifice that can make all of that possible. Romans 8, verse 32. Romans 8, in verse 32. Well, again, this is, this is such a powerful section. I want to read a little more context, I think. Verse 31, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? You think God was for us when God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, who, that whosoever believes in him would not perish? But what? They would gain eternal life. It's what this life is a staging ground for, is to enter into life that is eternal. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? The way has been made open by what the Father did and what Jesus Christ did. Galatians 2 and verse 20 brings us into where we are right now in the terms of the Day of Atonement. As we observe it, 
Of course, we need atoning for our sins. That's part of the message. But we're at a different place, a better place. As Paul says here in Galatians 2 and verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. I take this personally. I can put myself up on that stake and understand it, willing to give up my life. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul is talking about a reciprocal attitude here, a willingness to keep the sacrifice of Christ front and center in his thinking and in his actions. Hebrews chapter 7. Now you realize, of course, if I finish early, that just means you have to wait longer before you eat. <laughs> Hebrews 7, verse 22. I'd like to read through verse 28 here in this section. <clears throat> Hebrews 7 and verse 22. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Much better than the sacrificial system that you would read about in Leviticus 16, the Day of Atonement and sacrificing these lambs, or the goats, I should say. Well, there were many things being sacrificed then as well as at other times new moons and the Sabbaths and other, the holy days and so forth. And there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. So this had to be a yearly thing, month in, month out. But he became, he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Toning intercession on our behalf. And I think about a lot, and I'm sure many of you do, our brethren, and I would hope that as I think it says in Daniel 11 that some of those of understanding should fall or would fall to try them to make them white or robe, have their robes made white. Maybe some will wake up. We're an anchor point as long as we remain faithful to God for a touchstone for people to come back to, but how are people reconciled to God if they've turned away from God? It will be between them and God as far as their attitude of whether they've committed an unpardonable sin in that attitude because they have dis dismissed the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, which is a central issue in all that. You can't sacrifice Christ twice for yourself. You accept him and then you go forward and you don't turn back. Because you're not worthy of the kingdom of God if you do. But that's something we can pray about, brethren, and keep in our approach to be loving, to let God, and to ask God to work with people, strengthen us so that we can be a good example. That's the hard part for us, anyway. Verse 26, for such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints a high priest as high priests, men who have weaknesses. But the word of the oath 
which came after the law, appoints the Son who has been perfected forever. I Let me pick up something here. I have time to do that. I want to go back to, in, in Hebrews here, in the context of what I just read and pick up Hebrews 4 and verse 14 through verse 16 because this is a description of how each of us can act and react as we go through our lives, as we confront trials, and in times when we really need God's help. Hebrews 4 and verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Don't waver. Don't stumble. Get up and keep going. You might be bruised. <laughs> I fell off the back of the, my work truck. By, I notice as I get older, I don't, uh, I'm, I'm not as agile as I was when I was an instructor in Ambassador College in the PE department. Funny how that happens in this aging process. But anyway, instead of landing like a cat, I landed more like a slug. And, uh, <laughs> and I've got the bruises all along my hip to prove it. And it just brings this humanity to front and center. <laughs> We're physical beings, brethren. We need help, but we also need it in the areas of character, taking on the very nature of, of God, because we'll stumble there too, and we'll get bruised there too, but we need to repent and keep going. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of great grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. If you don't know any more than to just claim what is being said here, it's to go boldly before God and ask for help. Father, I need help help because Jesus Christ lives as our high priest and because he has atoned for us God hears well back to Hebrews 9 now verses 11 through 15 Hebrews 9 verse 11 but Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption, eternal atonement, brethren. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Those things in the Old Testament were markers to look forward to something that would occur. That has occurred. Christ did come to this earth. He did die for our sins. He is now alive in heaven at the right hand of God to do just what is being spoken of here. Verse 15, and for this reason he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance, which is eternal life. We can't enter into eternal life unless we are redeemed by Jesus Christ, by his death. Then let's go to, <clears throat> see where I am right here, Hebrews 10. Now I know I'm getting ahead of myself. 
verse 22, uh, first of Hebrews 9, <clears throat> through verse 28. This is quite a major theme, as you can see from the book of Hebrews. This isn't just Leviticus 23 or Leviticus 16. This carries forward this great master plan that sweeps throughout the records of hit human history and, of course, far beyond. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no remission, which I had read before. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Have you ever thought about that particular scripture and wondered about the throne of God and Christ seated at his right hand and perhaps both of them looking at each other and if that's, I mean, that's, I can only imagine this a little, you know, in, in my human terms, but the way they would communicate back and forth because he is actively our high priest. He would say something along the lines, Father, I understand. I went through this. Give him just a little bit more time. Let's dig it and water it, and maybe next year it'll grow, as the, the analogy says in the Gospels. If we come to God with the right attitude, unless we've so seared our conscience, like Satan did, and those demons who follow, those angels who followed him to become demons, unless we've entered that kind of a time, a mind frame, we have a chance because we have this redemption available to us. Verse 25, not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed to, for men to die once, that's because all men sin, and the penalty of sin is death. But after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for him, this eagerly waiting conveys an attitude of humility, the very attitude we should be reminded of when we fast and turn, realize how fragile human life is and how much we should depend on God. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. That's the good news. Hebrews 10, verses 1 through 4. For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come and not of the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who appear or approach perfect. The sacrifice of Christ can lead to our perfection. For then... Would they not have, or would they not have ceased to be offered? For the worshippers once purified would have had no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. We still keep these reminders, but we can apply the spiritual application of the meaning of it. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Simply not possible. Not an adequate sacrifice. Verse 10 of this chapter. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. 
But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Sanctified means set apart for a very special purpose, eternal life in the family of God. Hebrews 2, verses 10 through 18. Hebrews 2 and verse 10, For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, and this is talking about the Father here, clearly and explicitly, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Not only was he sinless, but he suffered without sinning. He died. He was beaten. He underwent those kinds of things. He was rejected. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. Here we go. <laughs> We're back there to John 17. When God was asked by Christ, to make us one with them as they are one with each other. Let me read verse 11 again. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them, us, brethren. Saying, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will sing praise to you. Can you picture that? I've talked about that. I think I've mentioned that before. The great assembly of the people of God in his family. To hear Christ sing praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. Inasmuch, then, as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death. That is the devil. He's going to crush Satan. He's going to destroy Satan and his world and his works. And release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed he does not take on the angels, or the nature of angels as the margin says, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. He takes on the nature of man. Therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. There's that word again. Atonement, brethren. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. He is able to aid all of us when we're tried, when we're tested. And I know that sometimes you might think, boy, I just don't know if I can go any further. I don't know if I can keep the faith that I need to keep here. Look to Christ, your high priest, our high priest, my high priest. Ask for help when you address God the Father. Say, give me the mind of Christ. Let him live in me and you live in me so that I can overcome these things. Now I want to close with a responsibility, a call to responsibility. In 1 John 3, verse 16, <clears throat> it 
1 John 3 and verse 16, By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. That's what Jesus Christ did. The next part of this verse is the challenging part for us, and it's a responsibility we can take with us to the feast, and we can do it in the typical ways that the Bible describes in other places. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren, loving the brethren, caring for the brethren, helping the brethren. And we have this highlight of the whole year at the Feast of Tabernacles and the last great day to do that. In a sense, we're laying down our lives because we're giving a little bit of our time away for to make sure that the other person is also having a good feast. Brethren, we've been called to such a glorious future. We have understanding of these holy days that the world simply does not grasp. I know Eric was touching on this in his sermonette, his offertory, I should say, about what it means, a little bit, addressing a little bit of what it means to just have this knowledge. Think about that. I was having breakfast the other day out at a Denny's, and I was just kind of couldn't help. The seats are close and listening to people talk, and it just struck me they do not have a sense of future like we do, a sense of purpose. Do you realize that how strong and how directed that we can be because we know what the future offers? I mean, you, <laughs> you talk about city planning, Mr. Bruno has tremendous background in that. And it's temporary, and it's good, and it achie achieves things, but the kingdom of God, the new Jerusalem, I mean, these are realities that will come about. Knowing that, then we order our life to make sure we have a part in it. And as we finish up this day, understand that as we complete our day of fasting and give God all the praise and all the thanks for the, His willingness and the willingness of Jesus Christ to be our propitiation, our atonement for our sins. See a lot of you at the feast, and may those of you who don't get to attend have a good feast too by joining us on the internet. We'll try to make the broadcast go out as smoothly as possible.